Good afternoon, everyone. It's so lovely to be with you all. Um, so we worked out, you don't like focus, you don't like censuses. What about the Euros? Anyone excited for the Euros? Come on, England. Are we going to win 3-0, 4-0, 5-0? Probably lose 2-0, but there we go. I love football. I love the Euros. Um, I'm not going to preach about the Euros, don't worry. Um, I love the Euros. Um, it's a month of just solid football. Um, I've watched at least half of every match so far. Anybody else with me? A couple of other people, okay. Um, I love it. It's just wall-to-wall football for an entire month. But even football one day will come to an end. Um, in those w- words that we were singing, forever all my days, um, Jesus is the one who lasts forever. Football has a natural end point, but Jesus lasts forever. Our worship of him lasts forever. And, and as a result, we want to be people who are um, saturated in what it means to be people who follow after Jesus, to be people who are following him, um, who are living in the fullness of what that means today. And Ephesians 1 um, is such a good place for us to start, naturally, because we're doing six weeks on Ephesians, so why would you start anywhere else? But um, just a little bit of context. Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul whilst he was in prison, in jail. Um, a letter written to the church in and around Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, Turkey being in Group F of the Euros, incidentally. Um, Turkey, uh, Ephesus being a major trade city at the time. It was a bastion of culture um, and religion and export. Everything was happening, a big melting pot of everything happening in the ancient world. And this letter would have been a circular. It would have been a letter that would have been given to the church and then passed to these different house churches in the region. It was before the days of WhatsApp broadcast lists and email chains that you can just reply to with a thumbs up emoji to say that you've read it. No, this would have been a case of stand up in front of the church, read it out loud, and then pass it on to the next group of Christians. And these letters that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, they contain an overview of all of Paul's theology, all of his understanding of who Jesus is and who we are called to be in the light of that truth. And um, it's not the longest of Paul's writing, it's not the fullest of his writing, but we have this, this broad overview of how he sees Jesus and how we're to live as a result. It's kind of like if you were to go on the I-360. Anybody been to the I-360? Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's the big donut on a stick on, on the seafront. And you go up and you see this incredible vista of the entirety of Brighton Town Centre. Uh, you can see Hove, actually. Uh, you can see the South Downs. And then if you turn the other way around, uh, you just see the sea, which is slightly less interesting because it's a bit samey. And you see the Rampian Wind Farm, which is slightly interesting. Um, but The point is, is that when you're up there, you have this broad view of everything that is happening and you see where things are in correlation to different neighbourhoods of Brighton and Hove. Um, And this is what the letter of Ephesians is like. You get to see all of these different aspects about who Paul understands Jesus to be, his character and his nature, and then how we're called to live. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 20 this morning. We're not going to read all of them because there's just way too much in there. There's so much uh, rich stuff that we can't read it all. Uh, but I do encourage you each week, perhaps, go and read each chapter that we're going to focus in on over the next six weeks. And we're going to read some select verses 1 through 8, 13 and 14, and then 18 to 20. And the words will come up on the screen behind me so you can follow along. Here we go. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his son's and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given to us in the one he loves in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding and then on to the verse 13 and you were also included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, 
the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Verse 18, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the work is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul begins his letter to the church in Ephesus by reminding them of their identity, reminding them of exactly who they are. Three simple words, but profound words. They are God's holy people. They are God's. We are God's. We belong to him. God's children, bought at a price, loved, chosen, forgiven, cherished, daughters, sons. Holy people, those who are being transformed from our brokenness and our shame, the things of our past that kept us heavily laden and bringing us to become holy blameless people who can stand in front of a holy God, not because we've somehow earned enough holy points or sang enough of those choruses that say, hallelujah, hallelujah, holy, holy, holy. No, because of who he is. We live in the light of who he is. God is holy and therefore makes us as individuals and as a group holy. God's holy people. This is their identity then. This is our identity as the church Now, we are a people, a community, a group, a gathering of people who think similarly, who pull in the same direction as a family on mission. That's why we reach out into the corners of our society that we see are broken and hurting and say, actually, we're going to do this together. We're going to do this because we believe this is who Jesus calls us to be. This is the holy God who came in the person of Jesus Christ to restore humanity back to its original design. And that left the Holy Spirit with us as our helper, our commander, our leader, and our guide. Now, the church is not a group of holy individuals, people who share a vague, similar interest, who think, actually, I've got a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. I might as well go and fill it by singing some songs and listen to somebody teaching. No, we are his children, sons and daughters. Just look to your left and your right for just a moment. These are your people. You are theirs. You belong to them. They belong to you. We have a shared father in heaven. We are all, as Paul says in verse five, adopted to sonship and daughtership through Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. And it's worth pausing just to look at this phrase just for a moment, because this idea was so important for the Ephesians church to understand at the time, and it's so important for us to understand in our walk with Jesus today. We can skim read this really quickly and go, okay, great, child of God, tick, I understand that. I'm adopted to sonship or daughtership, tick. But there's so much rich truth in this one phrase of how we live as followers of Jesus. You see, Paul intentionally uses this this idea of first century Roman adoption as his analogy, as his way of explaining how it is that we belong to God. I've spent hours on some super high-tech images to show you what this would have looked like. They're going to come up in just a moment. Um, I hope you're ready to be blown away. And just a disclaimer, uh, these are not quite as good as Katie Hipkiss's normal standards, so uh, it's all on me. Okay, here we go. The first one. In the first century, fathers in a household had a really strong legal right, a legal power over everything that they had. This power was called patria potestas. Um, And this power meant that you had absolute control over your estate. And this would include your property, your animals, your slaves, um, even your own children. You as the father had this legal right and power over them all. No matter how old your child would grow up to be, whether they kind of aged out at 18 or not, legally becoming an adult themselves, you would always have possession and power over your children until you were to die. And so as a result, in the time that this was written, adoption was a really complex and serious step. For someone to be adopted 
meant that they had to be passed from somebody's patria potestas and given away into somebody else's, out of the possession and control of one man and into somebody else's. And there was a two-step process by which this occurred. And usually it was used to redeem a slave. If someone said, actually, you have got this slave and I want to be able to set them free from your control and your power and bring them into my family and to my household, to take them from bondage and captivity and bring them into freedom. And this first of these two stages was called mansipatio. And the word mansipatio literally means to break the chains that hold you connected to somebody. That's where we get the word emancipation from. Mansipatio means that you are no longer under the hold and control, the ownership of one person anymore. And that means that you can then move on to step two of this legal process, which was a legal ceremony which was held amongst a group of witnesses who were saying, yes, we um, concur that this has happened. If anyone was to challenge it, you could say, no, this has definitely happened. And this would happen in front of your local magistrate at a court. And this was called vindicatio. You are bought and transferred from ownership from one person and brought and put into a brand new family. From that moment on, when these two steps have happened, the person who owned you in the first place, the person who controlled you, the person who had that ownership over your life, they relinquish, they give up all control over you. It's like this, this Bible I I was just preparing uh, the reading earlier today and I saw in the front cover, property of St. Paul's, Onslow Square, which is one of the HTB sites. So I think at one point, this Bible belonged to them, but it's no longer theirs. You can't have it back, St. Paul's, I'm so sorry. This is now our Bible. It is in our possession. I think they wouldn't mind us having their Bible. They're, They're a kind bunch up there. The consequences of this two-stage act is really important for us to acknowledge. You see, when someone was transferred from one estate, from one set of ownership into another's, that new adopted son or daughter becomes a fully legitimate heir of their new father's estate. A co-heir, even if the new owner, the new father has their own children by blood. And even if more children were to be born into that family, it's not like you would be usurped and kind of pushed to one side, like in the royal family where another uh, line of William would be born and then Harry gets pushed out and all the others get pushed out, pushed out. No, you are fully an heir to your new father's estate. And if you had any debt over your life because you were in slavery before, totally wiped out, legally no consequences anymore. Nobody and nothing has any hold over your life anymore. And this second step, this vindicatio, this is where we get the word vindicated from. And vindicated means to be totally and utterly set free and cleared of what has been before in your life. What's more, someone who has been transferred from this legal process of mansipatio and vindicatio, if they are a slave from their previous life, they can never, ever return to slaveship. They can never return back to their past life. Even if they were to commit something which meant that they needed to be put into slavery, they legally could not be put there. They're totally free. The slate wiped clean, totally a child of their new father. Verse five, it tells us that this process of mansipatio and vindicatio, this happens, this adoption happens because of Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Jesus' pleasure and his will sets us free. This wasn't a case of the father one day saying, hey, do you know what, actually, I realized that I've got some space for some more people, some more followers. Jesus, why don't you go and do it? And Jesus goes, oh, go on then. Begrudgingly, I'll go and redeem them. I'll go and set them free. No, Jesus does this for each and every one of us because of his pleasure and his will. It is his joy 
to say, actually, I know what stands before me on the cross. I know that everything about it is going to be terrible, but I'm going to do it longingly and willingly because I love my children. I love these people. I do it by my grace, verse 8, that I lavish upon them. To lavish something upon somebody, you can't do it sparingly. You can't say, okay, well, here's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. No, lavishing is to say, I give it all to you. Everything I have is yours. Everything that I have as my inheritance, I give to you. That is what is on offer to each and every one of us this morning. People who say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to live in the light of who he is. That is on offer to all of us this morning. I don't know about you, but that blows my mind. To be vindicated to be set free from what has been in my life before, the things that have kept me downtrodden, to get to walk out of an open door and say, it was nothing because of what I did, all because of the grace of Jesus that he showed in my life. So what is the guarantee? This second stage of the process, this legal process of vindicatio was to, have a group of witnesses. So who are those groups of witnesses for us today? Well, it's us. We stand alongside one another and we see each other and we say, you're set free and you're set free and you're set free. No longer held down by the chains of the past. You are free and I'm free. We get to do this together. We get to witness and testify to what Jesus has done in our lives. And we get to tell people about this incredible news. That is good news for a generation that is hurting and in need of Jesus. But also it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies and is the witness for us. Verse 13 and 14, it says, when you believed, you were marked in him, that is in God, with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. The Holy Spirit is given to us to lead and to guide us, but it's also given as a sure and certain down payment for our full redemption by the Father. One day, heaven will come down. All things that are broken will be made new. No more suffering, no more pain. The renewal of all things will come about. But until that point, Jesus doesn't just say, well, I've purchased you, you're now mine, but you've just got to wait and just see what happens and we'll get there one day. No, he says, here's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who is your deposit, the one who is the payment until the end of time. The Holy Spirit is given to us to remind us of exactly who we are and who Jesus is and how we're called to live in the light of that beautiful truth to reveal what Jesus has done and where we're headed. This is why Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. This is why he writes to all of the churches that he writes to, to say, this is who you are. Keep on telling this story over and over again. That's why our songs in worship that we sing here on Sunday are songs that tell of the truths of the gospel again and again. Because in our world today, we're given so much information from so many different places and it's so easy to lose sight of who Jesus is and what he's done. We remind ourselves again and again of this glorious story so that the potency of it, the power of it, is brought right into the very center of our lives once again to prepare us for weeks which are often challenging and difficult. Verse 18, Paul prays for the church. And he says this, he says, I pray that the eyes of your hearts would be enlightened in order that you would know the hope to which you have been called. Verse 19, his incomparably great power, that power which is the same that raised Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit that resides inside each and every one of us is the very same power that raised Christ from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. When he was dead and buried and no human hands could bring him back to life, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was raised to life. 
that power lives within you. The areas of your life today that seem dead can be raised back to life. The situations that seem like they are beyond hope can be raised back to life. The things that you think are dead and gone can be raised back to life because this is what Jesus does. This is what he does in community when we come together around his name and we say, Lord, we believe that you can do more than we could ever dream or imagine. What if we lived in the fullness of what that meant? Verse 17, we haven't looked at that, but David just reminded me of it earlier. It says that the spirit of wisdom and revelation is the thing that Paul is praying for this church, that they would have a spirit of reveal, being able to understand the revelation of who he is so that we might know Jesus better. I don't know about you, but I want to know Jesus better. I want to carry on through my life knowing Jesus better. I don't want to waste my life on trivial things. I don't want to waste my life on things that are meaningless when I get to the end of my life. I just want to know Jesus better. I want us to know Jesus better as his people. One of the ways that we can know him better is studying his word together. I'd really encourage you to come along to Discipleship Stream if, if you can. But the other way is that the Holy Spirit shows us. The Holy Spirit shows us who Jesus is. 